I love people's reactions when I tell them what I do. They're either <laughs> really grossed out by it or they think that I am amazing. It should not take all day to do a placenta. I was training on twins. Pathologist assistants, we are the eyes and hands of the pathologist. The draw for me is having a job where I get to work with my hands and I'm not stuck to a computer all day. Fast paced, moving all the time. PAs are looked at as a leader in the lab anyway. Top of the pay grade, non-thesis masters. I love that every day is different. I'm still seeing new things every day, learning new things. I love that it's so gross. To me, it's kind of like this morbid Christmas morning where you have all these presents to open up and you just don't know what you're gonna find. So the way I would summarize it is, if you really love the human body, especially gross pieces of the human body, and you wanna see that and work with that every day and you think it's exciting, this is the job for you. Yeah, okay. it's like dirty jobs. So if you love healthcare, but you would prefer to be behind the scenes, this is a really good place for you. So I'll just vomit some knowledge on you. That's exactly it. You got a lot of knowledge I don't. That's why you're here. So I'm very thankful for that. And uh, I think it's going to help a lot of people. Hi, everybody. My name is Boris. Welcome to my first episode of Healthcare Career Highlights. Today, we're talking with Shauna. She's a pathologist assistant, not to be confused with physician assistant, so for the rest of this video, when we say PA, we're talking about the pathologist assistant profession. Shauna, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me and to tell the world about your profession. I'm happy to be here. So all I really know about being a PA, a pathologist assistant, is that you work in the lab in the hospital, you have great hours, and you make like 100 grand a year, and that sounds pretty sweet. So what is a pathologist assistant? So a pathologist assistant is just like a physician assistant. We are allied health professionals that are essentially physician extenders. Um, in the case of pathologist assistants, we are academically and practically trained specifically to only work with one type of doctor, and that's a pathologist. So to understand the role of a pathologist assistant, you really have to know and be familiar with what a pathologist does. So pathologists, they are behind every diagnosis. When you have, go in for a biopsy or a skin scraping or, um, ooh, let's use a mole example. Yes. Okay, so you go into your, uh, your doctor and he is doing a skin check and he notices maybe a funny mole. He recommends that you get a biopsy and see what it is. Is it something concerning or not? So that, mole is shaved, it gets sent in to the lab, um, a gross tech will dissect it, it gets submitted to histology for processing and it gets turned into a slide. That slide then goes to the pathologist and he looks at it under the microscope and based on what he sees, um, he will, he or she, let's get that in there. Absolutely. Um, will make a diagnosis if it's benign, inflammatory, is it malignant, something you need to go back, and now you need to have more skin removed because it is malignant. Every diagnosis comes from a pathologist, but there's a lot of work that gets done before a pathologist is able to look at it as a slide. Another example to help understand um, the world of pathology is um, colonoscopies. Right, so you've turned 50, you need to go in for your recommended colonoscopy and they find a polyp. Well, they're gonna biopsy that polyp and they're gonna send it to pathology. It goes through processing, gets turned into a slide, and then it goes to a pathologist. Pathologist will tell your, uh, your doctor what it is and your treatment will be determined based on that diagnosis. Now patients, Never meet their pathologists. Pathologists only work with other doctors. So being in the lab, we are behind every decision that's made, especially for cancer, but nobody knows who we are or what we do. But it is incredibly important. So what you're saying is you practice medicine, but you don't really interact with patients. Yes. So if you love healthcare, 
but you would prefer to be behind the scenes, this is a really good place for you because the only people you're interacting with are your coworkers and colleagues, um, other doctors. So basically a pathologist is an MD, they're a doctor. They specialize in looking at human specimens, whether that's in the middle of a surgery or that's like a urine sample or, or a blood sample or anything that's basically taken to help in making a diagnosis. So that's what a pathologist does. And so then what does a pathologist assistant do? So essentially pathologist assistants receive in buckets things that come out of surgery, which is a lot of different things. I think most people think of going into surgery for cancer, but sometimes you get your gallbladder taken out or your appendix taken out. Um, there's lots of different things. Um, our bodies are amazing and they grow really weird things and sometimes they have to be taken out by a surgeon and that's where we come in. So essentially we get body parts in buckets and we dissect through them. We are trained to know the different process, pathologic processes to be able to recognize grossly if something is concerning for malignancy or if it's a benign process like inflammation. So really, pathologist assistants, we are the eyes and the hands of the pathologist because the pathologist is not going to see the vast majority of these specimens. So when we give a specimen, we begin the report. It's called a gross dictation, a gross description of that specimen. And then we dissect through it and look for any abnormalities, maybe nodules, areas of firmness, um, things that we've been trained that uh, are concerning. Uh, and then, then we take small sections and submit it for processing, and then those are what get turned into slides. So the pathologist only is looking at what I am submitting. Now, the pathologist can always say, I need more and we can submit more tissue if they don't have enough for diagnosis. Or maybe the, the sections that I submitted um, had some autolysis going on and they need more um, sections that are better for diagnosis. Okay, I like what you said there that you're the hands and the eyes of the pathologist. Mm -hmm. So basically, a specimen comes to the lab from whatever kind of surgery or whatever kind of procedure, and the pathologist only really sees it and they're specialized to diagnose things once it's already on a little slide, perfectly made. So they're specialized in that. They don't see the whole body part and they definitely don't get to like cut it up and see what's concerning and what's not. They just kind of do the last step, which is their specialty. You, as a pathologist assistant, actually get to see the entire, for instance, like when I was in the lab with you, we saw an entire placenta. Actually, I think it was a twin placenta, so it was really interesting to see. But you actually see the whole body part just right there on your lab bench, and you get to decide what parts you're gonna cut off, what parts you're gonna send to the pathologist for analysis, what parts are normal. That's all you. Yeah. That actually sounds cooler. I feel like I'd rather be a pathologist assistant than a pathologist because if you like anatomy and physiology, I think it would be cooler to see the whole part instead of just like, you know, little slides. And they are, they are trained. So residents, pathology residents, they go through gross training. So they've done exactly what I've done, but their, their time on it is shorter. Mm. Um, and they are also trained in autopsy. They had, they, it would, I think it used to be 50 minimum autopsies they had to do during their, their residency, but now it's reduced down to, I think, only 20 because okay. autopsy, the number is declining, mm -hmm. at least as far as hospitals goes. There's always going to be the need for forensic, but that's a whole different, uh, that's a whole different ballgame. You know, we're definitely going to talk about that because I think a lot of people who think pathologists also think like, you know, on CSI when they're looking at the body postmortem. That's not what you guys do? Um, yes, that we, we are trained in autopsy pathology as well as forensic pathology. Um, depending on how large your hospital is, most like average size hospitals only have maybe 50 autopsies a year. So mm -hmm. you're not doing autopsies that often. Um, now, forensic autopsy, those are medical examiner cases. 
And pathologist assistants, while we are trained in forensic pathology, there's not a whole lot of PAs right now working um, in the Emmy's office because they can pay a pathologist and they can pay deaners or autopsy techs, which they get paid a lot less. So they, at this moment, things are changing and it also depends on the state. So in the state of Minnesota, um, PAs can work in forensic pathology, but they take on many more roles. So they're working on forensic pathology, autopsy pathology, as well as surgical pathology. Mm. So that's kind of cool. So as a PA, you could work in a lab setting, you could work in a kind of an emergency setting, but you could also be not exactly a medical examiner, but have a lot of those roles in your job too. Mm -hmm. I think I do see the role of a PA uh, evolving Mm -hmm. to include more forensic pathology. And I know that a lot of people are interested in that. Yeah. It's just redefining the, the job description and kind of opening up the responsibilities as far as what falls under the certification. So I think at this point, like the, the PAs, we can write up the clinical history and the PAD and maybe even help work on the FAD but we can't sign it out. We're not going to sign death certificates. It has to be a, a pathologist. That makes sense. So kind of like the physician assistant profession, the PA pathologist assistant profession is probably quite new and also evolving and getting into all these new avenues. Uh, how old is your profession? Oh, I want to say it's like 30 years. Okay. So it was only around since like the 80s? I want to say, or maybe 70s. I, I okay. think it's, it started in the 70s. Okay. So pretty similar. It seems like a lot of these uh, physician extender positions have only been around for about 50 years. Uh, 60s and 70s is when a lot of this stuff seems to have really taken off. So that's pretty cool. And the drive really is um, a shortage of pathologists. Mm-hmm. Residents, or not residents, but med students, as they're going through and they're figuring out what type of doctor they want to be, less and less they are choosing to be pathologists. So as long as there are um, shoes to fill, because we have a shortage of pathologists, there's always going to be room for PAs to grow and fill that role in different ways. Yeah, it seems like that's the way medicine is going in a lot of avenues. So like there's a healthcare or there's a shortage of primary care providers for doctors just because it's the lowest paid specialty and that's probably the main thing. So now nurse practitioners, physician assistants are filling those roles. You can pay them a lot less than a physician because they were trained for less time, you know, two years as opposed to close to 10. Uh, but they can do a lot of the same work and it's just a great opportunity for folks like us who don't want to go to school as long, but do want to do the work. Yeah. So it's amazing. And I think in the future, there will be fellowships for PAs to specifically train in maybe a subtype of pathology, like maybe GI. So in the future, we can help triage slides. And I would love to see the role open up to maybe even help signing out cases for non-malignant things. Like Also, like you kind of go through the whole process. If it doesn't look nearly bad enough to you to even warrant a pathologist looking at it, a PA would be able to sign off on it instead of it going all the way up to the pathologist. Or at least maybe put all of the report together and it still gets the pathologist would look it over and see if they agree with the, okay. agree with the diagnosis and still have the final signature on it. But things for like uh, polyps or um, like inflammatory diseases mm -hmm. like Crohn's or UC, things that are not um, malignant and maybe less, like lower risk. Okay. That's, that's a way we could start wedging in our way to microscopics. So There's kind of expanding people, your scope of practice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, really the only way PAs are involved in microscopics right now is in research. So, mm -hmm. which is something that I could see myself interested in later down the road um, because it, you're not making a diagnosis. You are conducting research. You're writing papers based on what, what you're finding. So a PA can do that. That makes sense. So that's kind of exciting. Kind of the, the scope of practice for PAs can move up 
to be a little bit more similar to like what a physician assistant does in some settings. Like obviously the really complicated patients or the really complicated cases, the doctor would still definitely be the one to handle that. But something that seems a little more straightforward, we can handle it all the way up until the very end where the doctor basically just says, you know, this is what I would have done. I'm signing off on it. Thank you for doing basically all the work I would have. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's just kind of exciting. We get to practice as physicians with that little, well, I guess that big safety net of the actual physician making sure we don't mess anything up. Right. So yeah, that's, that's really exciting. So what is a pathologist assistant's day like? What do you do day to day? I think it, honestly, it also depends on where you work. Um, so you could work for a private pathology group that contracts with a lot of different clinics. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you are just in a central lab that all the specimens are coming to you from all over. Or you could be working at a large hospital and you are where the specimens are. Mm. Um, and in that, so in the instance of private practice where you're receiving all these specimens from all these different clinics, you won't have some of the responsibilities like frozen sections because you're not in a hospital with a, sur with a surgical suite. Um, so you're, what you do on the daily basis will highly depend on what type of pathology group you work for and if you are in a hospital or a central lab um, or maybe you are helping out with with autopsies and the role also changes if the hospital is an academic institution versus a non-academic institution because academic places if they're attached to their own school of medicine the pas also take on the role of training residents in like pathology the, residents pathology residents yes oh. um so you'll have you you will have responsibilities to train pathology residents in grossing techniques as well as autopsy techniques and what else academic Ooh, Nothing comes acad oh go ahead at an academic institution as well you are probably going to take more sections, take more pictures because they're always thinking about publications. Mm. Um, and you'll also be submitting more for perhaps tissue banking or future research proje projects. So academic institutions, I feel they open up a lot of opportunities for PAs to um, do all the things we were trained to do in school. That's pretty cool. So depending on where you work, let's say you like some aspects of being a PA more than others, you can kind of choose a job based on what you really like to do. It's not like every job is the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know that there are definitely uh, people out there who don't like the stress of frozen sections. Mm -hmm. So they will be happy to find a job with a private group that doesn't deal with frozen sections. That's available. For, them. for sure. And I actually want to talk about the job market and how easy it is to find some of these jobs in just a moment. But one thing I'd kind of like to, to summarize and kind of make sure I understand correctly. So something you were talking about earlier was how pathologists are trained to do everything that you're trained to do. They can do all the gross anatomy. They can do all the sectioning and stuff. Um, but just because it's more efficient for them to do the final product and for you to do that, that's why pathology assistants exist you're kind of specialized in those parts of their process that they don't do a whole lot. And then because you're the experts in that, you actually train the pathology residents to do those things. Is that right? Yes. And I will say too that um, pathologists, the whole point of us taking over the, the gross dissection and all of this kind of hands-on work is also to keep the pathologist at the microscope because that's where, that's the money maker. Yeah. For so your it's all group. financial. Yeah. So it's kind of like a surgeon is most uh, financially beneficial when they're in the OR. The way things are going in the surgery realm is like physician assistants are kind of taking the pre-surgery care and the after-surgery appointments so that the surgeons can stay in the OR where the hospital gets paid the most. So it sounds like it's the same thing with pathology. They're paid the most at the, at the microscope. So the hospital wants to keep them there. And then they hire people like Shauna uh, to do all the prep and all that stuff. Precisely. Okay. 
And so even if, if a pathologist really likes gross anatomy and they really like sectioning and they like preparing the samples and seeing the entire body part, the hospital says, no, you need to stay at the microscope. We're going to hire Shauna for three or four times less money to do that fun stuff because it's more efficient. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about working in different areas, uh, different kinds of hospitals, different kinds of labs. So mm. what is the job market for a pathologist assistant, a PA? Is it easy to get a job? How competitive are these jobs? I, in my experience, I will say that labs are growing mm -hmm. and positions that are open are not because people are leaving, they're because the practice is growing and they need, there's more work, they need more PAs. Everyone in the class before me, they all had jobs before they graduated. All the of same them? for the everyone. Wow. The same for the class before and the class before. I will say that if you are tied to a specific city or a specific state, mm -hmm. then things will become more difficult for you because our certification is national. Mm -hmm. There are jobs all over the country. Um, but if you're not willing to go to the job, you're you will have more difficulty. So it's definitely easy to get a job overall. Like you said, everybody in your class and the class before you had a job before graduating, which is incredible. I know with PA school, it's definitely not like that. Or with a physician assistant school, it's definitely not like that. You know, the job market's great, but it's not that great. So that sounds extremely good. Uh, are some specialties in some areas better paid than others? I would say uh, the average is around 85 to 95 starting, mm -hmm. uh, but that's dependent on where you are in the country just because cost of living is different. So if you're in New York versus the um, the Midwest somewhere versus the California, I mean, San Francisco yeah. is super expensive. So you better get paid more if you're working out in San Francisco. That makes sense. But that's new grad is average of like yeah. 90,000. How much can you expect to grow? Uh, as you get more experience? I think definitely over 100K. Uh, and it's also highly dependent on what extra responsibilities you take on. Mm -hmm. PAs can function in management uh, roles. Mm -hmm. um, actually, being in a, like a senior position, a highly trained position, you are most often, PAs are looked at as a leader in the lab anyway. Mm -hmm. But if you want to make more money, you're probably going to have to take on a management role. And I could easily, if you want to be a lab manager somewhere, even possibly move up into director position, hmm. um, you know, maybe 150. So just a really quick comparison here, just because I'm a physician assistant student, Shauna is a pathology assistant student. Uh, it sounds like the job market is definitely more reliable for pathology assistants, and they make about the same, almost identical actually, to physician assistants uh, with the same room for growth. So it's really interesting. And so for you personally, Shauna, aside from the great salary and the potential for a really good schedule, why did you actually choose to become a PA? I love people's reactions when I tell them what I do. They're either <laughs> really grossed out by it, or they think that I am amazing. Um, so the, the <laughs> polarization of the response to what I get, <laughs> what people think, I, I needed a hands-on job. Um, I love that I get to work with just coworkers and colleagues. I'm behind the scenes. I love that every day is different. Mm. I don't know what is gonna come to my bench. Um, I like that I get to be a lifelong learner. You know, I don't see myself getting bored, especially with different opportunities, like I mentioned before, in academic institutions. Um, there's just a lot, a lot of things that I could do. So when I do get bored with something, there's something that I can pivot to, um, to pique my interest again. So for me, it hits, it checks all the boxes. Absolutely. And more specifically about actually the role of a PA, you know, working in the lab, getting gowned up, working in a kind of a sterile environment, like the actual day-to-day -day work of being in a lab. Did you always enjoy that? I will say that there are times where you are really, really busy and you feel like maybe you're on a, like a working yeah. line and you're just, you know, banging out specimen after specimen. Um, but at the end of the day, 
every specimen comes from a person, right? Mm -hmm. So it is incredibly important that we take each specimen seriously. So for me to have that um, purpose attached to what I'm doing is mm -hmm. also really important. So like with every job, especially every professional high paid job, you know, there's an element of the grind in it. You're there to be productive and sometimes it gets really hard, but it sounds like you really appreciate the fact that your job helps people and every single specimen, even if you get a hundred in an afternoon, every one of those is from a person. And so you do your best because it's literally, you're helping a person, you're saving their life. There, I worked at a, a lab that said, treat each specimen like it came from your grandma or oh, your grandma. Good. Yeah. And then that will change your mindset. Let's say you're getting frustrated because of the workload. Just think of it, treat, treat this specimen as if it was your grandma or your grandpa. Yeah. I think that's something they tell a lot of healthcare providers. And it's, it's funny, it's different ways that it kind of becomes a grind, like with, uh, with hands-on actual patient care providers, like I'm going to be a PA, a, well, a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner or a doctor. The grind kind of becomes, I wish I could spend more time with this person and influence their life more, or maybe people are rude to you. So you have to kind of have that emotional uh, kind of thick skin and just really kind of get through the day that way. To you, like you said, it's more of like being on an assembly line. There's just so much work and it's hard to connect. But at the same time, like every one of those, you just want to help a person and you're doing it at such a high level that it is really gratifying. Yeah. Another thing that I just kind of thought of is mm -hmm. if you think about it, every specimen that comes to your bench is a diagnosis, is potentially cancer. So you doing a good job could potentially save someone's life but you can do that way more times than a doctor or a physician assistant can see patients in a day. So basically the point I'm making is you can get through well over a hundred small specimens in a day. And every one of those could be someone's life if you diagnose colon cancer, like we're talking about. Whereas even a very efficient, very, very speedy uh, healthcare provider will never see a hundred patients in a day. They might see 30, maybe 40 if they're insanely fast, but we'll never have the same number of people that we can help per day that you do. So that's just kind of a cool way I, I was thinking about it. Oh, yeah. So transitioning to PA programs, pathologist assistant training programs. So because it's such a desirable job, I'm assuming PA programs are pretty competitive. So how difficult is it to get into PA school? Uh, you know, I don't know if I can say exactly how many applicants. I know that there are hundreds of applicants and each program only accepts maybe two mm -hmm. that, or to 25. I think the largest group is 25. That's pretty uh, low a percentage. Yeah, because they're not taking a lot of students every year. It really limits. I mean, that's what makes it competitive, right? Mm -hmm. There's limited spots. So who gets um, those spots? Right. So here's what you can do to kind of beef up your your application i think it is incredibly important to be familiar with this profession meaning that you have worked as a gross tech side by side with a pa at minimum you have should shadow a pa and know what their day-to-day -day looks like and make sure that that's right for you it's a two-year program and it is it's a it's an intense two years so you should really make sure that you want to do this before before you get started and if, if you can't work as a gross tech i have had uh, classmates that didn't have any grossing experience um, but they did have autopsy experience so they worked as a deaner mm. um, so either get yourself some autopsy experience work as a as a gross tech which you can you don't have to have a bachelor's degree to be a gross tech, you just have to have a minimum number of uh, biology and chemistry classes taken already. Um, so close, usually it's like junior, senior year of like a biology degree. Do you have enough science credits to qualify to be a gross tech? So go do, go do that. Um, observe an autopsy because I don't think you know you can handle that until you're actually in the room. Um, yeah. So if you can, sometimes that can be difficult if you don't already have connections in the hospital to observe. Um, 
but if you can try try and get as much exposure to pathology as you can um, you're gonna have to take anatomy and physiology if you have ta experience in anatomy or physiology that would look really great hmm. um, they like to see genetics and biochemistry those are not required but they like to see those classes as part of your undergraduate degree um what else so being proficient in a lot of the higher level science courses especially obviously anatomy and physiology mm -hmm. uh experience you said might even be more important than grades you have to know what a pa does and you yeah. have experience in the autopsy lab preferably in the lab, just making sure you know what you're getting into that you really want to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you can demonstrate you have a good understanding of the profession, that that is really important. Yeah. Um, I I had really good grades. I think that that does make you competitive. Some programs require the GRE, some do not. Hmm. So um, maybe that's a factor in where you apply. Um, is there like a minimum number of hours of experience that you need in a gross lab or a pathology lab or anything like that? Or is it just you need to demonstrate that you understand what you're doing? Yeah, at this, to my understanding at this moment, programs don't have a minimum requirement for mm. shadowing PAs or even autopsy because they know that it's difficult for people to find that if they're not already in, if they don't have a network that allows them to do that. Right. Um, so they don't have that as a requirement, but that's what makes you competitive. Okay, so it's not required, but it is the best thing for you to do. And so that, in addition to good grades, is what you really need to get into PA school. Yes. So would you say anything else as far as advice on how to get into PA school for people who might be interested in this profession? I think pick, pick a program, look at... Um, Look at their clinical partners mm -hmm. and decide how you want your clinical year to be shaped. And that can help you decide on where to go okay. um, when, you, when you're applying. I think as far as getting into pathology assisting school, as long as your, your grades are really good and you've demonstrated that you know what a pathologist assistant does, when you interview, I think they also consider demeanor. And if you um, present yourself as someone with energy and a good attitude and a willingness to learn and especially an excitement and passion for the, the profession that that's also really important. So there, there is an interview aspect of this. Mm -hmm. If somebody out there really wants to be a PA, a pathologist assistant, good grades, especially in anatomy and physiology and experience, enough experience that you can demonstrate that you know what a PA does and why you want to be one is the main things that you need. I will say this as well. Um, having prior working experience is also really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, if you worked as a med tech, that's awesome. If you worked as a, a histotech or a histotechnologist, that's really great because um, the specimens you submit as a PA feed into histology. So knowing the histology department is really going to help you out. Um, even, even being a, an EMT, is that, is that right? An EMT, what's the, em the emergency medical people? What are they? Yeah, like the people on the ambulance and EMT. EMT, yeah. Mm -hmm. So EMT experience is even really helpful because if you are doing autopsies they come with all those i don't know if this is morbid or not but the the bodies arrive with all of the lines and um, tubes with them so you need to know what those are those are so you can document them okay so not just lab experience but basically medical experience being a patient care tech and emt something like that could also help you yes 100 percent. that's cool that makes sense so it sounds like there's no like strict guidelines for how many hours, but you just have to demonstrate that you know the whole medical process, you've worked in the medical field and preferably in histology and things like that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So do you feel comfortable sharing your stats? I know pre-PA, pre-med students always like their stats. What GPA do I need? How many hours? So what was your GPA? Sure. So I graduated um, with a degree in biotechnology with a 3.9. Wow. 
does everybody need a three nine to have a chance at getting into PA school? No, I think that at minimum you need a three zero. Keep okay. this in mind. The reason why I think they look at that is when you are in the program, you need to maintain a GPA of three of a three point zero. So even though you have 18 credit hours a semester and you are under all this pressure, if you don't maintain that 3.0, you could be asked to leave the program. So right. they want to make sure that um, you demonstrated in the past that you you've kept your grades up. So you're more likely to be successful if they accept you into the program. Yeah, it's interesting. One thing, so one of my most popular videos is how to get into PA school with a low GPA. And a lot of people who maybe didn't do very well in college still want, you know, an amazing job like being a PA, a physician assistant or a pathology assistant. But one thing that you really need to ask yourself is if you ended up graduating with a low GPA, you may have had some struggles, some obstacles or some things that came up. So maybe you are a good student, but something's happened. But you need to look at it from the school's perspective. And they have this incredibly rigorous curriculum. And the job that you're going to do is incredibly important and difficult academically and people's lives depend on it. So it does make sense that you really do want as high of a GPA as possible so that they can trust you and your academic abilities. But I guess what I'm looking for here is numbers. So like you had a 3.9, you got in, you said at least a 3.0, just based on your experience about what was the average college GPA of the applicant that actually got in? Oh, there, I feel like we're all type A, high, high strung perfectionists. So if they all weren't above a three, like six, I would be, I would be very surprised. Okay. So they definitely were, high they were GPA. Six. Yeah. But I, I will say this, depending on the, the program that you could make up for it, as long as you meet the minimum requirements, they're not going to, you know, throw those out of the the window for you but as long as you meet the minimum requirements i feel like you could make it up with experience you've worked as a gross tech for years you've worked as a, a histotech for years or a, a deaner to come with that experience i think you could make up for a poor gpa that makes sense okay. so i had a really strong background um, i did research projects i worked as a research assistant while i was in school um and after i graduated i ended up kind of moving more towards histology and i took i studied and i took the histotechnologist exam so i am also a certified histotechnologist mm -hmm. and that's how i got into pathology after i moved into histology i then wanted to learn more about grossing so i moved into the um, into the gross room as they call it and i worked as a path tech um, starting on small things, polyps, appendices, gallbladders, things, things of that nature. And that's when I met a PA and we started working together and said, you know, this is really cool. I would love to handle these bigger specimens. So that's how I got sucked into pathology assisting. So it's kind of like a lesser known profession, at least to me. I didn't know anything about it until we met. And it sounds like you were the same way until you just met one randomly out in the field. No. Is that right? Um, well, I actually did know about pathology assisting before I met one. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking I was about to graduate with my bachelor's degree and I was like, do I go on for my master's? Am I done yet? I don't feel like I'm done. But I also don't want to worry about a thesis. So I might have Googled non-thesis master's degrees hmm. and pathology. And that's what came up with pathology assisting. So then that search led to one of the, the local labs um, in Salt Lake City where I was living at at the time. Hmm. They, they happened to have a pathology assisting opening. And it was at the top. If you you can sort your your search by pay pay grade, and they were <laughs> at the top of the pay grade, yep. so it started ticking a lot of boxes for me. Top of the pay grade, non thesis masters, and then I really started to to look more about the profession, and that's actually what changed my direction into histology because I knew that was a way I could get into um, into pathology was through histology. 
So maybe that should be the slogan for the PA profession, a better paid, more exciting alternative to research. Yeah. <laughs> Not to beat up on researchers. No, I mean, it's important. Somebody's got to do it. Research is fun. I think that for me, the, the turnoff of a PhD was, it, I felt like you spend a lot of time writing, asking for money, like finding grant money. True. Um, and I don't know that I have the patience for that. Mm. I, I like the more fast paced um, environment of what I'm doing now. That's really interesting because, okay, so I know a lot of pre-meds, there's definitely way more pre-meds than there are pre-PAs. Everybody goes to college who studies biology thinking I'm going to be a doctor or maybe a PA, like a physician assistant, and they always push you into research. And so they always make you like do lab work and all this stuff. And some people end up falling in love with it and going the PhD route and being researchers. Mm -hmm. And then some people just kind of do it and then go into med school or physician assistant school. But there's this interesting kind of like in between happy median, which is what you do, which is still clinical, still fast paced, still way better paid than research, at least for most people, but you're still in the lab. Yeah, it's great. Absolutely. Uh, so can you tell me what the training is like? I think it's about a two year program, right? It is a two year program. So the first year is didactic. It's all coursework. Um, I had 18 credit hours every semester. Fun. So it's, it's three semesters. You don't get a break. So it's nonstop for two years, summer, spring, fall, like everything. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of classes. It was a lot of work, a lot of late nights. Um, it, but the prize is the second year. And the second year is one complete year of clinical rotation. Mm -hmm. So you rotate through different places and where you rotate will de is, is dependent on where you go to school at. So each university um, has their own clinical partners. And they all have their own different way of um, doing this clinical year. So in didactic year, like you said, it's a ton of late nights. It's a lot of work because you're learning anatomy at a very, very high level. Uh, probably more. So. Go ahead. And it's not just anatomy. So a lot of uh, what we're learning is pathology. So we are learning pathology, applied pathology, um, gross pathology. There's a lot of different angles coming at pathology. So you have to go through every organ system. Mm -hmm. You have to learn what's normal. You have to learn what's just benign. What what does the healing process look like in this organ? Mm. Versus, and what it looks like. Yeah. yeah. And, and then what what does cancer look like in this organ? Because you could have, you know, carcinoma in different organs, right? But it's, it looks different in each organ. Right. So what you're basically trained to do is to know the entire body anatomically, all of the disease processes, processes that every organ system can have and what they look like at every stage of the disease and every stage of healing. And the reason for that is because a specimen comes to your bench, you have to know exactly where that came from, what you're looking at, and basically to help make a diagnosis that way. Yeah, so we, we have to learn about differential diagnosis, right? Yeah. So we have to know, okay, what commonly happens in, in this organ? Is it an infectious process? What are the common um, infections of this, this organ? Like specifically about lung. Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't want to talk specifically about lung. <laughs> we could do specifically gallbladder. Or yeah, gallbladder. I mean, I feel like gallbladder, um, yeah, something more of a gross tech would, would do and not necessarily a oh, no. Okay. But it's a good example because people know what gallbladders are. Exactly. So a specific example, let's say you get a gallbladder on your bench and you basically have to know what's normal for a gallbladder to look like, what's not mm -hmm. normal, what could be going on with this person. And you also get their symptoms and like what they said they were feeling and the imaging and you have to make that final diagnosis based on what it looks like. We're not, not a diagnosis because PAs don't make diagnosis, but we do steer the pathologist in a direction based on, um, you know, 
describing what we see. So mm -hmm. in, a, in a gallbladder, we do know what normal looks like. Very commonly, it will have cholesterolosis. Uh, cholecystitis is usually why it's being taken out. Mm -hmm. uh, we look for stones. Um, and if you have large stones, they can even erode through the gallbladder. So oh, wow. that's something important to note um, in, in your dictation. So all of these things, like, like we've discussed before, we are the eyes and the hands of the pathologist. And the pathologist needs to know all of this, even though they're not in the seat of gallbladder. Right. So you're training to basically know what every single part of the body looks like normal and abnormal with all the common diseases that that part gets. And best of all, you only get one year to learn all that. So I can see why there's so many late nights. <laughs> yes, it feels like a tidal wave of information just <laughs> coming at you. What's with all the water metaphors? Because medical school and PA school, like physician assistant school, they always say fire hose or fire hydrant of information. You got a tidal wave. That's even more dramatic. Yeah. Yeah, because you're just watching it come at you. Just yep. <gasps> And somehow a lot of it's sticking, but you just don't get to sit there and appreciate how much you've learned because there's always more stuff to learn. There is. Ooh, I have another way of explaining it too. So <laughs> first year, the didactic year is like you're in a tornado full of like, like book pages and you're in the yeah. middle of the tornado just trying to grab onto whatever book page that you need to know or retain. I love all these dramatic metaphors, but that's true because like, it feels like you're in, like you said, a tornado. You don't know which way is up and down and you realize that you have to know all this stuff and it's all around you, but there's so much of it. It's, it, it's it really, really chaotic. Is. First year in PA school is really chaotic. I but think like that you said, the gift is the second year and that's when you get to apply all this stuff and go, holy crap, I actually know a lot. You do. You surprise yourself because you you know more than you think. Right. And you get to make those connections, right? Oh, I read about this, but now I'm actually seeing it. So right. now that starts to lock information in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, from my own experience as well, that's probably the most gratifying thing is like you read about something, you might even see a bunch of pictures of it, but until you actually see it and touch it and know exactly what color it is in real life, you, you don't really truly appreciate it. But then once you see that, you're hooked. Yeah. It's so oh. cool. So then, so first year is just a ton of information, learning all the stuff we just talked about. Second year is different clinical rotations in various kinds of pathology labs. Mm -hmm. And how many of those are there? You said you get a whole year? It's a full year and that how many you have is really, you know, dependent on your program and how they manage their students. Mm -hmm. um, I know that some places you could have a full year rotation at one place, really? but that's, and that's possible because that one place does everything, mm -hmm. frozen section, autopsy, um, large complex cases, as well as smaller cases. So a student can rotate at one place for the full year if their, their rotation site can provide all of that. I think- most places you're going to rotate at least four different um, four different institutions. Mm -hmm. So you'd have three three month blocks. Um, and I know that at least some programs you will rotate through um, an ME's office. So you will get your autopsy training at an ME's office because it's really hard to get autopsy training at a hospital when they only have maybe one a week. Right. And you're, you're only there for a few months. So it's easier to get your autopsy training at an Emmy's office where it's all day back to back to back to back. Autopsy. Makes sense. And it sounds like whatever accreditation body gives you your certification, they have requirements of like you have to have a certain number of autopsies, a certain number of this kind of specimen, certain number of that. And so you need your rotation sites to help you meet all those things. There, so the accrediting body for the schools is NACLS. And then our... NACLS, N-A-A-C-L-S. NACLS, okay. And our certification is through the ASCP. Um, you can insert in later what that stands for. Yeah, like, I'll look that up. I think it's the American Society of uh, Pathologists. Okay. Something. Pathologists. Okay. We'll Google it. Yeah. Um, so that certification through the ASCP is national. 
and well, it's good in the U.S. and Canada and in U.S. territories. Okay, so you could practice in the U.S., Canada, and any U.S. territory with that one certification. With the certification through the ASCP. That's awesome. Now, um, in addition to that, some states require licensure. California, New York. So basically, you take your certification from the ASCP. You say, here's state of California. Look, I really got my, my certification. And then you pay some money, and then you're also licensed. So it's just paperwork and money to get your license in California, New York. I think there's a few other states that require a license as well. But the vast majority, they you only need your certification. Makes sense. Yeah, I know California and New York really like their paperwork and their money. So I've definitely had experience with that. <laughs> um, but so, so at the end of this training, you've gone through your didactic year, you've passed all your exams, you've done everything you had to do, you went through clinicals, then is there a final certifying exam? Yes. So after you graduate, you qualify for the ASCP uh, certification exam. And then you'll schedule you'll schedule your exam. It is a adaptive test. What does that is mean? Is that the right word? Adaptive? adaptive. I think that it's so it's an adaptive exam, meaning if you get one uh, question right, mm -hmm. the next question will be harder. Oh yeah. Until you get you're just at hard questions. So I've been told that if you feel really bad when you leave, it's because you were answering a lot of questions right. Well, that's good. Stressful, but good. Yeah. Okay. So there is a final certifying exam. You sit for that, and then you become a licensed PA, and you can practice. A certified PA. A certified PA, and you can practice. Yes. Okay. Once you come out as a new grad, you're not expected to know everything, and you're really um, your fine polishing happens at your first job. So that's really key when you graduate to find a job that's going to fine tune your skills. You know, I've heard the same thing about physician assistants. It's kind of like your first year on the job is basically your residency. You have a lot of training, but you're not really going to become proficient until you're about one to two years in the field. Uh, well, I mean, when you're training in school, you are, it's this broad, uh, this broad thing that you're training, where when you get your first job, they're going to have their own specialties, and you, you finally get to hone in on one thing versus know everything. Yeah, just a little bit of everything, but not enough to apply in practice. So you said during the interview, you need to demonstrate that you know what a PA does and demonstrate enthusiasm for the profession why you actually want to be one, why you're going to subject yourself to this incredibly difficult training, why do you actually want to be a PA? So I'm going to ask you, Shauna, what is your favorite thing about the PA profession and why is it that you actually wanted to be a PA? I, like I said before, I love that every day is different. I'm, I'm still seeing new things every day, learning new things. Um, I love that it's so gross. Um, to me, it's kind of like this morbid Christmas morning where you have all these presents to open up and you just don't know what you're going to find. That is the best description that I have ever heard. That is phenomenal. <laughs> A morbid Christmas morning where you get to work in the morning and you see all these specimens, all these body parts that were taken out of human beings and you don't know what you're going to get. So you got to yeah. unwrap them and then... <laughs> Yeah. So here's the thing. I, I'm, wa I'm waiting in my career to find this. So there's something called a dermoid cyst. Yes. It happens in the ovary. And because it's a teratoma and it can grow different uh, tissue types. So often you will find hair and sometimes like teeth. You can have brain tissue in it that you'll see microscopically. It's just this mod podge of tissue types in in the ovary in one day i will find a red-headed dermoid cyst that is your goal in life a red-headed yes. dermoid cyst a red-headed dermoid cyst that sounds incredibly rare but it's possible it, yes so yes, not to give a, a big anatomy lesson or an embryology lesson to the general youtube community because they'll definitely turn the video off but very basically 
you know, anyone who studied biology and embryology knows that you have the three layers, the mesoderm, ectoderm, and endoderm. I know I got the order wrong while you're developing. And from those layers of the embryo basically come different kinds of tissue. So muscles, brain tissue, skin, and a dermoid cyst and base is basically when that goes awry and kind of a, fe a pseudo fetus starts developing and all those little layers develop into this big cyst that has just basically mystery meat in it. And you don't know what kind of tissues in there. And so it could, like she said, hair, teeth, and all that kind of stuff. So a redheaded dermoid cyst is basically one of those happening with what would have been a redheaded baby. And she wants to find that cyst that has red hair inside it, which is already very rare. Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get some uh, some serious <laughs> views on this video. <laughs> Maybe we'll lead with the redheaded dermoid cyst. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so. I think what that basically did is it illustrated exactly the kind of person that should become a PA. Somebody who just loves anatomy, who thinks the human body, even when things go wrong, is the coolest thing in the world. And they just love seeing specimens and different parts of the body and working with them. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, yeah, that's definitely going to make it into somewhere around the intro. Um, and maybe I'll post a, a picture of a dermoid cyst, but I'll put it at the very end so it doesn't turn anyone off. Um, or but, turn somebody on. Right? Okay, you know what? Maybe we should put the dermoid cyst in the beginning because if... So this video is for prospective PA students and PAs. So if yeah. that turns you on, you should probably be a PA. Yeah, that's a good sign. It's a good start. Basically, okay. So the way I would summarize it is if you really love the human body, especially gross pieces of the human body, and you want to see that and work with that every day and you think it's exciting, this is the job for you. Yeah. Okay. It's like di dirty jobs. <laughs> kind dirty of dirty jobs. jobs, but people find yeah. pleasure in that and they love them. <laughs> so it sounds like you're exactly where you want to be, and that's amazing. You've really found your niche uh, in the world and in the hospital. And we as healthcare providers, as scientists, and especially on this channel, we like progress. You know, we like things to get better every single day and nothing should just ever stay the same as it is. So is there anything that you would change about the pathologist assistant profession? Oh, anything that I would change. I think, give me one moment. I think I wrote something. Take your time. And I know you talked about residencies and like new avenues, so you can go that route. What question number is that? Nine. Number nine. Actually, the, the numbers may have changed no. a little bit. It's the second Thank to last you. one. Okay, there we go. So as far as what should change, I think that, I think as we discussed before, kind of opening up the responsibilities, having fellowships available uh, to in order for PAs to specialize in something, especially if you have, it's a larger pathology group, you have multiple PAs, mm -hmm. why not have each of those PAs be a specialist in, in something? So you have a GI specialist, a GU specialist, maybe you have a gyne specialist. Um, that way you have someone to turn to that has put in the extra time to really know the disease processes of that system. So you, you have an expert essentially with you at all times. Um, I think I think another thing that I would really love to see is more of a, a standardization of how PAs are used mm. because really it depends on where you work, what you're allowed to do as a PA. There are some places that are really, really great and you can do everything. So you can do surge path, autopsy path, forensic pathology. They allow you to work in, in research, whereas other places, Maybe they're smaller and they don't have some of those things available, but you're really just, you're just grossing. You're at the bench all day long. And I think that it would be really great to just open up, open up the profession to prevent burnout, to prevent, um, you know, maybe getting bored with what, what, what you're doing. Yeah, allow your PAs to grow and to specialize in something that they feel passionate about. So now you have an expert in that subspecialty. I think that would be really cool. 
And I know a lot of the mid-levels, nurse practitioners, physician assistants are going that route. So I don't see why pathology assistants wouldn't go that route too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All it right. just takes time. It just takes time. Progress takes time. And, you know, they're all new professions and they're moving into new avenues. So I'm definitely excited to see where both of these professions will go. All right, Shauna. Well, this was amazing. I learned a ton about your profession. And honestly, I hadn't even heard about it until I met you. So thank you for coming on the channel and teaching everyone. If anyone has any questions about the profession, leave them in the comments. Another great resource is Path Assist website or is it's, the Path Assist website. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Yeah, so if you go to pathassist.org, um, it's a website specifically for pathologist assistants, either current students or graduates. There is a job board there. Um, we have student delegates from each program. So if you do have questions about a specific program, there is a part on the website that you can find your delegate from the program you're interested in, and you can email them specifically with questions that you have. Um, it's just a really great resource. There's also grossing guides based on CAP guidelines. Anyone in pathology knows that CAP um, comes up with all, all the rules and regulations that we need to follow in our PATH lab. Mm -hmm. um, there are also really great resources for setting for the certification exam. There are even practice exams and quizzes on there to, see, kind of, to test yourself and see where you're at. There's a really great reading list uh, that outlines the, the books that were used to create the certification exam. There are also uh, video lectures, or no, not lectures. There were video recordings of conferences past. So I know like their 2017 AAPA conference is up for you to watch. Um, and there's also ways to volunteer. If, if you're a student or if you've already graduated, maybe you feel like you need to pay it forward, um, there are volunteer opportunities for you as well. So it sounds like anywhere you are in the pathologist assistant process, whether you're just someone looking into it, you want to know more about it, or if you're already a student or a practicing PA, Path Assist definitely has a lot, um, a, a lot of information for you. Yeah. All right. So if you're interested in becoming a PA, definitely start there. The show. The show. All right, folks. Thank you for watching. Please consider liking the video and subscribing to my channel. And I'll see you in the next one.